Tink. Tink. The repetitive sounds of metal on stone assaulted my ears. An endless, monotonous drone created by a chorus of pickaxes slamming against the walls of the mine. I did my best to let it become background noise, losing myself in the work. The movement became my buffer against the sound. The burning in my arms and the sweat stinging my eyes distracted me from the throbbing in my head. There can be a silver lining anywhere if you look hard enough. I was one of the oldest, although I wasn't exactly sure of my age. Early to mid-teens at most. My sister was a few years younger than me. Most of the kids in the mines were around her age. I tried to keep track of our birthdays at first, but as the months went on, it became harder and harder to keep track of time. There were nearly a hundred of us working the mine. All of us were sold to the corporation by parents or caregivers who couldn't afford to eat otherwise. Which corporation? I couldn't tell you. One of many. The logo on the trucks that collected the ore we mined didn't have any words. It could have been any of the numerous conglomerates that rose to power when the world burned. It didn't really matter. I was sure it was much the same regardless. It was okay, though. They kept us fed and clothed. The food wasn't good, but it was nutritious, and it could have been a lot worse. The clothes were scarcely more than rags, too small or too big for whoever wore them half the time, but they kept us covered. The boots were good, though. I had always noticed that the work boots they gave us were a reasonably good fit and had toes capped with steel. If we hurt our feet and couldn't walk for a while, we weren't much use to anyone. It was like I said, silver linings. When you were growing up as much property as a person, you had to learn to appreciate the little things. Injuries happened, but they were reasonably rare. Deaths were rarer still. We looked out for each other in our mind. The corporation even had some of us trained in basic first aid. I suppose we had one of the better ones for our overlords. Only a few more hours left today, I called out. Hang in there! As one of the older kids, it was my job to be a leader and caregiver for those who were younger than me. It wasn't an official position as such, but it was encouraged by the powers that be. I think we probably would have fallen into a similar arrangement one way or another. Not that everyone appreciated my constant encouragement. Fan-fucking-tastic, Ethan. The biting, sarcastic remark came from my sister, Ivy. She wasn't far from me, swinging her pickaxe into the wall and collecting any trace of metal she found. Her hair, usually cut short, was starting to grow out and was plastered to her face by sweat. She was smaller than me, but fierce enough that it was a good idea to avoid crossing her while she was holding a pickaxe. The sharp glare and red face only amplified the impression that she was a little unhinged. She wasn't, but I still didn't want to make her any angrier. Quiet, I said under my breath. This only gets harder for everyone if we don't stay positive and keep our morale up. Besides, kid your age shouldn't have such a dirty mouth. What exactly is positive about this? She hissed back. It's over 40 degrees, my arms are on fire, and my head is pounding. I just want to go to sleep, but you have just reminded all of us that we have hours of this left. It's well over 40 above ground. I think it's actually a bit cooler down here without the direct sunlight. Oh, well that makes it better. The slave labor keeps us from getting sunburn. I don't think it matters when we work so hard it more than makes up for it. It isn't slave labor. We only have to work until we're adults. Then we can transition to paid work. That's sooner for you than for some of us. If you just stay positive and focus on the work, it'll be over before you even realize, I reasoned. Bullshit. Language, I reminded her. We don't even know how old we are, Ivy shot back. How are you judging that I'm too young to swear at you? At this point, other kids in the area were noticing our dispute and it was distracting them from their work. We'd had many different versions of this discussion over our time in the mine. Ivy always seemed determined to embrace the worst of the situation. Obviously, it wasn't the best life for us, but it could have been worse. I figured she just made things harder for herself and for everyone around her with the constant negativity. I could see the questioning looks from some of the others, Ivy's friends especially. I would have to shut this down and bring the mood back up or it would hurt everyone's productivity. That wouldn't be good for any of us in any capacity. Come on guys, back to it, I called out, smiling widely and putting that grin in my voice. I can practically taste dinner already. 
We're going to feel this time a lot less if we're busy. Let's show them that we've earned our meals. Begrudgingly, the onlookers slowly started returning to their work. They kept looking at us out of the corner of their eyes, and their hearts weren't really in it. The damage had been done. But it was something. Ivy was the last to return to work. She spent a long time just standing still, glaring at me. I could feel her anger. I met her gaze and matched her glare with a smile. Eventually, the two of us were working side by side in silence. I liked those moments. The two of us working together towards a common goal, putting our differences aside for the greater good. More or less. There's always a vein of silver to be found, if you're willing to dig for it. Hello and welcome to Stories Across Borders. Here we discuss stories told across a range of different mediums. Books, movies, games, all that good stuff. The only rule is that we are only allowed to talk about things in terms of the story, so anything like animation, acting, mechanics, etc. is off limits. Seeing as it's the fourth week of this cycle, though, that probably won't be an issue. I'm Daniel Radford, author, just doing my best, and also your host, and today I'm joined once more by my usual co-conspirator, John Kernan. I'm also doing his best. Setting a high bar for yourself there. Yeah. John was, of course, the voice you just heard reading a very positive story, positivity being the theme we are wrapping up with this episode, and the story you just heard being Digging, a short story I wrote just for this podcast. Not gonna lie to you guys, uh, I'm currently suffering a, just a multitude of different ailments, but uh, fitting with the theme, I'm going to do my best because I have faith that this will somehow still turn out to be worth listening to. Fuck yeah, positivity. We'll definitely do his best to keep up with it, but, you know, health stuff happens. It's important. And the story is short. Don't be mad at us if we don't talk about it for an hour and a half. <laughs> we so, talk a lot already. <laughs> we talk so much. Right, digging so, when we first decided to do positivity as our theme for this cycle, uh, I joked that I would do a story about toxic positivity so I could still make it unpleasant. And I did <laughs> actually kind of do that in the end, <laughs> with a bit of a return to my specialty genre of children suffering. But I... Yeah. That being said, I want to do something a little bit more nuanced than just positivity yay, or toxic positivity bad. Uh, yeah. So, we've got Ethan and Ivy and all these other kids, you know, forced into this dystopian mine, basically, working their tooth and nail, clawing their way up toward the hopes that one day they will, uh, they will grow up to become paid employees. <laughs> it's kind of a nightmarish hellscape of a situation. We've got the two siblings. Ethan, who is a little bit older and who kind of has the perspective that if you if you look hard enough, you can find a silver lining anywhere. And as long as you can find that silver lining, you can keep going forward. And then you've got Ivy, who's a little bit younger, but whose take on things is everything is shit and pretending it's not shit isn't going to make the shit go away. <laughs> nope. And what I was going for with this is basically that neither of them is wrong. No. I mean, Ivy is is exactly right about everything she says, but also yelling and stamping about it and making everybody take longer to get their work done isn't going to make it better. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Like, she has every right to be angry and upset. But it's not like she's offering solutions. And, and, and by the same time, Ethan isn't wrong either. Like, keeping a positive mindset and appreciating the few good things they have in their life is going to be important for getting through the years and years of basically slavery they have left before, before they get the upgrade to servitude. Yeah, in situations like that, it's sometimes the difference between life and death. Yeah, and Ivy is at risk of falling into a very dangerous negative spiral and dragging others with her if she can't find those good things to latch onto. But 
Ethan's relentless positivity is probably is hurting Ivy and probably others as well, because his own refusal to really acknowledge the gravity of the situation and how messed up it is, is not allowing himself really or them to probably process their suffering. And if you can't process the things that are going badly in your life, you're going to explode eventually, because it's just going to build up and up and up, and you're going to see more minor outbursts from Ivy before she just combusts. Yeah, you can't just keep all that stuff inside. And you especially can't just ignore it and hope it's going to go away or pretend it's not there. Exactly. Like, uh, like I drew a lot, i got to admit, on some personal experiences of mine for this one, which I don't normally do when I write. Oh yeah, I remember that. Your years in the mine were pretty tough. <laughs> no, I didn't I I never did have years in the mine, blessedly. But I've definitely been in situations where I've been feeling incredibly unwell or in a lot of pain, like now. <laughs> where, <laughs> but even worse. And you don't want to just hear someone offering platitudes telling you that you know, it's everything is okay. You don't have to worry. There's nothing to worry about. Everything is okay. Because it's a lie. Everything is not okay. You feel like utter shit. You're in agony. You are in the process of suffering. You don't want to have someone telling you everything is fine when you know it's not. Everything will be fine, maybe. But you want to be allowed to say, yeah, but it's not fine right now. Yeah, you want to be allowed to feel your feelings, even if they're bad. Yeah, exactly. It's like you've got to you've got to appreciate, for want of a better word, the negativity. Uh, because if you bury it, it's not going to go away. <laughs> no, no, it does not. And I we all get forced to learn that lesson at one point or another. Yeah, and I mean, I found myself getting like just like angry at people who were just trying to help because the way they were trying to help wasn't like it wasn't giving solutions to the problem it was giving those platitudes and no one wants to be told that you know oh it's everything's fine i made because it, it makes you feel like you're being belittled like you're making a big deal out of something that is very much not when the reality is it is a big deal yeah feels like your problems are being devalued exactly and you know i i've been on the other side as well to an extent where not in exactly the same way but i'm always but sometimes what people like a lot of time when people come to you for help what they don't want solutions either what they want is you to just tell like they want they want to be comforted to be allowed to have a hand helping hand in processing their negative emotions they don't want well here's what Here's the logic of the situation. Uh, and I do tend to immediately jump to, like, finding the logic in a situation. Yeah. And... It's a bad habit of mine, too. Yeah. Sometimes it's what people want and need, but a lot of the time it's really not. And it creates tension. And Ethan and Ivy are kind of like the extremes of both sides of that, I guess. Yeah, they're both aware of the problem, but... One has already acknowledged that he can't fix the problem and is manifesting that it's just trying to make things better through purely emotional appeal. And the other one is essentially just letting that negativity run free and allowing the emotional damage to manifest in actions because... She doesn't have a solution either, but she definitely doesn't want to just ignore the problem. Exactly. And honestly, I feel like both of them, both of the kids, are spiraling towards burnout. Oh, yeah. He can only keep up with what he's doing so long. He's trying to take on everybody's emotional responsibility. Yeah, and he's and he's investing so much of his like emotional resources into keeping up this positive front. 
which it's dangerous for himself and others because I mean, no, again, we've established he's not letting anyone else process their negativity, but he's not processing his own either. He he's always pushing it to the side, but going, okay, yeah, but it could be worse. But yeah, almost every situation could be worse. It doesn't make the situation you're in now better. Yeah, and um one thing we consistently see with a lot of forms of intense positivity, especially positive to or uh toxic positivity but it also sometimes comes in with non-toxic positivity is like you know we talk about how happiness or positivity can also be like a self-creating thing you give someone a little positivity they put more back into the world and you get some of that but the thing is without breaks the one thing that does happen with that positivity is when you put some when you put positivity into something or someone that positivity plus one it doesn't immediately come back to you right away and when you're putting everything out there everywhere you can at some point before all that comes back to you you're gonna hit zero and when you hit zero it's not as simple as just not being able to be positive for a while burnout on trying to be positive and optimistic and sunny it's it's a bad thing i've been there it doesn't it doesn't quite necessarily show on the podcast obviously but i've spent a lot of time when i was younger stuck in situations where i couldn't do anything about it and i was just reaching for the positive constantly kind of like ethan before i even realized i was doing it because i was around other people who were not only causing the problems for me but were obviously much more negative and hopeless about it and i've had a couple times where i've hit that point of zero and it made me realize just how bad it is because you don't just hit zero the second you hit zero you spiral straight into the negative. And when you're at the negative, that's a self-fulfilling thing too. You don't just sit still and relax and collect yourself until the positive comes back. It's bad. And that's what Ethan is heading towards right now. Yeah, he's building himself up a very fragile tower. And he keeps building it up without addressing the fact that there is no foundation for it. And eventually gravity is going to win and he's going to plummet. And because he's built himself up so high, he's got a lot further to fall. Yeah. Ivy is at risk too. She's going to burn out. Just she's, she's running on anger right now. And anger is a very powerful fuel, but it is not sustainable. Nope. Eventually it, it either... quickly. Yeah. Eventually, it either burns out completely or it changes its direction, and anger you can't control is no... It's always fitting that people control, uh, compare anger to fire, because you can, you can use anger, but the second you don't have complete control over it anymore, all it is is a disaster. Hmm, maybe there's a reason people keep making that association. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like, what what's going to happen to her, probably, if she doesn't deal with her stuff, is that she will burn out, she will become a husk, or she'll, or she'll have to keep finding new things to fuel the anger and the rage, and will have to turn it outward eventually to other people. But I feel like that's going to be, le but that's not going to be explosive, that's a petering out. What's going to happen to Ethan if he doesn't deal with his problem? Is going to be a lot more explosive because falling from that great height off of that tower is going to carry a lot more force to it than a, than a fire just petering out over time. Yeah, when when you make that fall, there's always collateral damage because that tower may be fragile, but that doesn't mean it's not heavy. And when you fall, all those pieces fall with you. Yeah, and in the case of Ethan. His tower is pro is made up of, like, those little white lies that everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, that he's been pushing onto other people. If he breaks, there's going to be a wave of that 
where anyone who's been buying into his rhetoric is gonna is gonna cop the fallout. Even some people who aren't are probably gonna cut the fallout because he's you know put himself into this position of leadership. There is this unofficial position of leadership on him because he's the oldest. So if his tower breaks and falls, all those pieces are gonna rain down upon the uh, all the other kids who are gonna have to deal with it. Yeah. I mean and looking at the way things are right now, like it seems like other than outside intervention, the only thing that could really stop both of them from heading to these bad but currently inevitable conclusions would be to sit down and have a talk about it because each one needs what the other one is doing right now. They need to balance themselves out a little bit with each other instead of clashing. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it in one. Like they they are the solutions to each other's problems. Ivy needs to learn from Ethan to to find those little veins of silver, the the good, the linings in the clouds, because she needs a fuel other than rage to keep her going, or she's not going to make it. And Ethan needs to learn, like, learn to accept and process the negativity uh, and the fact that he he just has to admit to himself, yeah, the situation is horrible. And whilst, and yeah, it could theoretically be worse, but there is no amount of good you can find in these little victories that is going to outweigh the fact that you are literally child slave labor right now. Yeah, you, need you to have to accept your situation and let it breathe. Yeah, take those little victories, absolutely, but accept your situation, because otherwise you're heading for collapse. And they are definitely, that is exactly what I wanted for them, is for them to be those two other sides of of the spectrum. Because I personally feel like truly having a positive existence, like a positive feeling within and of yourself, is less about joy and more about balance. Yeah. It's about and not only not only do they need that balance from each other, but they also like need each other. Ethan right now really needs somebody to put a hand on his shoulder and be like, hey man, it it can't be all sunshine and rainbows all the time. We already know it's not. Give yourself a break. Let it out. And and somebody really needs to grab Ivy and talk to her and be like, hey, I hear you. I see you. Because you're not even getting properly acknowledged right now. Ivy's not getting proper acknowledgement now. She needs a little she needs a little less stop it and a little more like I see you, I hear you, I get it, I'm I'm going through it too. It's it sucks. Yeah, it's it it's a matter of just acknowledging the, the feelings because yeah, of course of course you feel bad. Look where you are, but it's, but at the same time you're just just raging, especially against people who are legitimately just trying to help you, isn't a solution. It's not going to make you feel better in the long run. It's just going to add to the negativity. Yeah, that's not to say you shouldn't acknowledge and process the negativity. You definitely need to do that. It's the one. It's what you do that Ethan doesn't. But you aren't necessarily processing it in a way that's healthy either, because that's the thing. Is um, I feel like stories don't often really delve into this sort of thing. They often keep it like very one-sided, where the lesson is either embrace the positivity, embrace the good, or they do the lesson of let it out throw out your, like, embrace your rage. And I, I feel like that uh, the discussion is should be more nuanced than that a lot of the time. Because I don't think either approach is entirely correct on its own. I think they are both part of the answer. Like, it, it reminds me of, uh, of all things, do you remember the Simpsons episode where Flanders finally loses his shit? That is... Kinda what it is. 
he's he's bright and positive and cheerful all the time even when bad things are happen are happening and he's unlucky enough to be in a place surrounded by people where all too often none of that positivity he's putting out into the world actually comes back on him and instead he's actually getting given shit for it and eventually he snaps yeah he As snaps everybody he always and, will and he doesn't really get nothing good out of it like he gets nope. a release but it doesn't fix the problems it doesn't change his situation nothing becomes better uh, and that's that's where we have it, like that is the situation that we have Ethan and uh, Ivy in. Ivy is doing that, is 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 exploding with rage right now. She's angry, but it's not going to fix anything. It's just going to, it's just an endless cycle. But by the same token, Ethan's not fixing anything either. Uh, the reality mm-hmm. of their situation, as horrible and grim as it is, is it's probably not us. They're probably not in a position to fix and change anything. No, the best thing they can do is try to get through it and support each other. And this is not like that. I like neither of them are unaware of this. I think. No, I say I think like I didn't write them. <laughs> no, because if if I, if if Ethan was completely unaware of it, he would be shutting it down a lot more distinctly and directly maybe even getting a little bit angry himself over it. And if Ivy was completely unaware of it, nothing would calm her down and she would only get more angry at Ethan trying to placate her. Yeah. For for Ethan, it's a matter of we don't have a solution to this problem and we never will. Our only hope is to just keep clinging to those little victories until we get to the end and then we get a job out of it when our, when our debt is paid and then we can start living the life we want it's just a matter of time it's just a matter of waiting it out but for ivy she what she's seeing is yeah but that's a long time to suffer like this my guy and, and everything it's gonna already be longer for me now. Than for you yeah and you know, and what happens when you're gone, huh? When you when you get to leave and enjoy your new paved life, and the freedoms that come with that, what then? Yeah, what 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 happens if you make your big fragile positivity tower, and then manage to leave without it falling down first? You just you just you just get on a little plane at the top of the tower and fly away and leave it there. Yeah, it's still else gonna fall to down from the bottom. They, it's gonna fall. It's exactly the like. It's effectively the same thing as a power vacuum, but it's a positivity vacuum. If if the yeah, beacon exactly. of positivity is no longer there, something else has to fill that place. And because you've been such a beacon of positivity, and you've not been helping anyone else process their own feelings and their own negativity. There's not going to be anything but negativity to flow into that space. And in fact, probably what's going to happen is a lot of that negativity is going to be just be hatred for you. Yeah, and unlike a lot of the uh, a lot of the things we metaphor and compare them to directly, positivity and negativity do, in fact, cancel each other out, which is why we have math terms for them. And that's a lot of responsibility to put on someone else's shoulders too. Yeah, the... you may not feel like you're doing that because you nobody ever put the responsibility on you, and you don't want to put the responsibility on someone else. But once that thing's there, everybody can't exist normally without it, and something is gonna change in relation to or pursuit of it without you there as that pillar. And, like, the thing is, well, like, Ethan is banking a lot on this idea that everything will be so much better once he's out there getting paid. But he's ignored... Yeah. It, 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 like, it's a, it's a brief tidbit, right? But there is, a, there is very much a line in that story about when the world burned and the corporations took over, basically. The yeah, world I mean, beyond the mine be is Mad real. Max meets Cyberpunk. 
it's not a good world. And I think it's not going to be pleasant for him when he does make it out there. And he is, you know, getting a stipend, basically. He's still going to be stuck working for this company, quite probably, because there's only so much work to go around and all that. And it's not going to be a lot of money. It's not going to be luxury. It's going to be better than what he had, for sure. And for a while, he'll love it. But eventually, he's going to have to come to the realization that his life's not that much better. Yeah. The main and only real significant thing he's going get to get out of it is being able to say he's not property anymore. Which isn't nothing. That's, that's nice. But um, when not that much materially changes, it makes that change also feel a lot less significant. Like... What's the difference between someone who works 15 hours a day in a horrible uh, in a horrible office with a boss who yells at them and then goes home to live in a tiny little crappy apartment and watch their tiny little TV for like an hour and then go to sleep because got to get back to work tomorrow. How far off is that from just being a slave? It's better. But uh in some ways, it's pretty easy to call it a different kind of slavery. Yeah, like, it is it is objectively better to have your freedom. But I think Ethan overvalues how much of that freedom he is actually going to have. And honestly, in some ways, he's better off as a kid in the mine than as a minimally paid adult working in the same kind of mine. Because There are protections for the kids. They're not great, but they're there. Yeah, I mean, obviously the company there is not trying to get those kids killed because they're free labor, but, like, he's being fed and clothed in those mines. He's gonna have to pay for lodging, for food, for clothing, off of a very meager amount of money once he gets out of that mine and, and into a paid one. And that's gonna be stressful. And he's not really given himself the tools to cope with that stress. So he's, he's going gonna to find himself in basically his... the same situation of building this very fragile tower. And he's going to be leaving behind his friends who have been like siblings to him for so long either. And situation like this, place like this, I'd also imagine, I don't think he's probably going to really going to be able to be in contact with any of them anymore after he's gone. So they're not just losing him, but he's losing them too, for whatever that's worth. He's yeah. going to have to swap out and replace, get rid of his, or lose his entire support structure, however meager it may be. Yeah, I mean, like, they might tell him they're sending his letters through. <laughs> that doesn't mean they are. But these kids don't seem like they're getting a lot of letters. Well, most of them are orphans, or the, uh, well, the, not necessarily orphans. They're either orphans, or they've been sold. And once you've sold your child, like to, to just so you can survive, I imagine that you're not gonna. They're not gonna want to hear from you, probably, and you may not be able to bring yourself to contact them again because, like, what right do you have? Yeah. And again, like, that's the kind of world that Ethan is leaving these minds to go and be a part of. He's built up this idea that he's going to be so much happier out there, but the world out there is a world where people, this is this desert hellscape where people are selling their children to corporations for slave labor so they can survive. Yeah, that's a big thing, right? Like, hey, buddy, you're going to be free. You're going to be your own person. You're going to be free and your own person in a world where your parents had to sell you into slave labor to survive. Yeah, it's he has a rude awakening coming his way in one form or another. Either he's going to snap as a kid down in the mine, or he's going to snap as an adult when he gets out there and finds out that very little has changed. And he has to deal with the guilt of that forced positivity he thrust onto his sister and the others. 
Honestly, it would be better for him in the long run, I think. If, if, he, if he's going to snap, he's better off doing it whilst he's still down in the mine there with his sister and his friends. What friends he has. How oh, good. There is a helicopter flying over my house now. Oh, wonderful. At least I can't hear it. Look, I understand there's fires and things and you need to put them out. We have a podcast to do here? Yeah, come on. Priorities. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like he's um he at least if he snaps as a kid, there's other people there to pick him up. And in a way, I almost think maybe like that would finally be Ivy's chance to switch from just venting her anger all the time to putting a little positivity in cuz I've seen situations like that a lot of times where it's it's only when the person who's trying to be positive snaps all the time that it really puts into pers- or snaps really hard that it puts into perspective what they're doing for the people around them who didn't even realize that they were leaning on that positivity coming out to help prop them up all the time and that were because uh, they were too busy being angry or bitter and being annoyed at the positivity even as they also couldn't actually continue to keep up without it and they step up to the plate and when they step up to the plate and give a little bit of that positivity back actually try to be there and be someone to lean on that ends up being what the person who's snapping needs to finally take a breath see what they're doing And, like, it gives both sides perspective, Uh, even though snapping is awful and you don't want to do it in general. As long as the person who snaps doesn't go completely ballistic about it or isn't, like, a purely toxic asshole about it, sometimes that's the perspective that everybody around needs. Honestly, you might be right that for this situation, like, Ethan's tower might need to fall and fall soon for them to actually be in a position where they can properly have an open, sincere discussion and find that balance they need. But it's got to be soon that that happens if it's going to happen whilst he's down there because he's risking alienating his limited support network as is. And we've talked about that in like the previous episodes, right? Where if you push your toxic uh, positivity on people, eventually the the sheer force of that is going to drive them away from you yeah, and it's once that happens, you're not likely to make anything better. And Ivy's at less like Ivy's at less risk of that than Ethan, even though she is putting all this negativity out there. The things she is she is saying is going to resonate a lot more with the other kids. Yeah, she's not going to push true. them away in the same way because the things she's saying are true. And they are feeling all those same things that she is feeling. So she isn't risking losing her support network the same way Ethan is. Her, like, she has problems. Very real problems in the way she's processing all of this stuff. But she's not actually as at much risk as her brother. Because the way he, the way he desperately clings to these little victories and disregards all the bad things is going to leave him alone when those bad things catch up with him. It's like, you could only run away from the animal chasing you so long. You know, if you're being chased by a tiger through the jungle, you could only run it so long. It's going to catch you. It's faster and it's stronger and it knows the terrain. <laughs> and that's like, a, I feel like that's a pretty good, like, metaphor. Not Maybe not as good as the tower, I liked that. But... <laughs> for 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 what Ethan is going through right now is that he's running away from this predator and expending all of his energy on running away from it where what he should be doing is looking for ways to properly combat it so in so when he so when it does catch up with him he can fight it at full strength as opposed to just getting consumed as he is right now he's just running until he trips and falls flat on its face. 
Yeah, and when when you're being chased by something nasty, rule number one is don't fall over. Yeah, especially not if you're running next to someone else. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ethan. Ethan could learn a lot from probably from Forrest Gump. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Like if we if we if we were to like look at the the previous two stories we've we've done for the episodes, Ethan could learn a lot from Forrest, and Ivy could learn a lot from Amy, because Forrest never fails to acknowledge that bad things are happening. He's just, just... prepared to work within the the confines of what of those negatives. Like yes, he has a very cool. similar yes. attitude to Ethan. Yeah, Ethan's close. Like, Ethan is prepared to work within that badness to make things better. That's what he's doing. But he's devaluing his own work by not acknowledging what he's going through and not letting it letting it air out, letting it be. Yeah. He's he's kind of the dark mirror to that to to the Forrest Gump brand of positivity of Take the small victories, accept that life is going to throw bad things at you, and work within those confines. He's kind of like the the bat, the reflection of that. Whilst Ivy is, she would have a lot to learn from Amy, who is, you know, kind of the inverse, where she is, yeah, things are really bad. Let's process the bad, and figure out how we can cope with it and deal with it in a way that's healthy for us. Yeah, because the one thing you can't do is She has to learn to build on herself still, too, but you know. Yes. Yeah, no, it's... They could both learn a lot, because, like, the one thing you can't do is you can't stop. Yeah. Like, there's there's no stopping. You, You keep going until you die. It's just a matter of what your life up to the end point is gonna be like. Yeah. You're not You're not working to live. You're working to live better. Well, they're kind of working to live and more specifically working so their parents can. Are they working to live or are they living to work, am I right? Ugh. But yeah, again, like this is very much the sort of area I wanted to get into where I wanted it to be like more of a discussion about balance rather than just Negativity bad, positivity good, positive, uh, you know, positive negativity, toxic positive, whatever. I wanted it to be, uh, a discussion given prose form. This idea that you need to meet in the middle. Uh, it's you. You can't just embrace the negative or the positive. You have to find that middle ground, because positivity doesn't function on its own, and negativity needs positivity to temper it. True. And I know I said this already, but I feel like you really just don't see that a lot, where it's where it's given that like that nuance. Where I mean, you do. It's not like it's never done. I'm not saying like I am a visionary or anything like that, but but I do think, especially in children's media. Now that I think about it, like more recent stuff, I I suppose has been better about it. But especially remember when we like when we were growing up. And like all, all, all the like children's media, like little young children's media, is all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> and there was never, yeah. there, there was never really an acknowledgement of that. Sometimes life is bad, and that's, and it's okay to be upset about it. I think it's gotten a lot better over time, though. That sort of thing. I was lucky to be watching Courage the Cowardly Dog, Courage which is never afraid example. to admit that life sucks. Yeah, honestly, Courage the Cowardly Dog is like the perfect example of that middle ground of of, everything here is horrible, but I'm going to deal with it because I've got this person I care about so much and who has been so kind to me and who and it is so kind to me and that makes it worth it. Yeah, it's it's very much the idea of using these small victories. much like the lesson from Forrest is is exactly where Ethan could be. He's so close. Uh, but the thing that courage does that he doesn't is that courage 
is very much willing to embrace his fear and his negativity. I mean, his original catchphrase was, this shouldn't happen to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Courage is never afraid to acknowledge how rough stuff is. He just also doesn't let it stop him from working to make stuff better. He yeah. lets he lets his pain breathe. He screams, he cries. And then it gets solved. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And again, like that's 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 where we're at with Ethan and Ivy, right? Ethan's got to get on with it, but he needs to learn to scream and cry. And Ivy's got to scream and cry, but she's really got to learn to get on with it. Yeah. Which <laughs> neither one can just solve the problem by yeah, itself. Which, which to a lot of Ethan people is to go from doing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. And like you know, it's the scream and cry is necessary. It's it's an important lesson in life. Everybody has to learn at some point. Because everybody intrinsically feels the need to get their pain and everything out. But also, people often and usually don't know how to do it in a constructive, healthy way and keep working to make things better at the same time as they're doing that, which leads to overcompensating in the other direction. Because you see over and over again what seem like these examples of, oh, being upset, being sad, being angry is is bad. It never makes any anything better, so I should just not do it. And like, well, that's not really right either. Yeah, it's like, uh, being angry or sad and letting those emotions out, it's not necessarily going to make your environment better, but it's going to make your internal environment better, your mental situation. Because you need to process that and let it out. Otherwise, you just it just builds. And I feel like, yeah, constant negativity is going to have a negative effect, possibly. But when you've already hit rock bottom, <laughs> almost literally, I mean, I don't think Ivy's really going to make it that much worse. <laughs> to be honest. No. Like, don't get me wrong, if she's, all she's doing is putting the negativity out there, it's not going to have a good effect, but the things, she she's almost going to be acting as a second-hand catharsis for a lot of those kids who are being prevented from letting any of that out because of Ethan. Yeah, whereas, exactly. And it needs to. Whereas he's just burying it, which I truly believe like what like legitimately i 100% believe it is way more dangerous to yourself and others to be relentlessly positive and never acknowledge the bad than it is to be relentlessly negative and never acknowledge the good neither is healthy don't get me wrong both are very bad for you but i think i think toxic positivity is actually worse oh yeah well especially cuz the negativity as long as you're not some sort of impossibly stubborn completely mentally minded grumpy asshole the negativity always has room to like be lightened be dispelled like dispersed but the to the toxic positivity is kind of like even though it's anger that's always compared to heat the toxic positivity in is is in its own way it's like a matter of pressure and it keeps building up. And when pressure builds up without release, you don't feel bad. You don't get sad. You explode. And when you explode, the pieces can't always be put back together. It's like a volcano. Like you can plug that hole, but then when it but when it finally explodes, all that it's gonna do is make it worse. There's gonna be that much more pressure built up because you never let it vent. You never let it yeah. breathe. And that is actually how it works in nature. Like, there are volcanoes that, like, have plugged, basically. Just naturally, they've filled in with rock or whatever over time. And when they, ex like, when they when they erupt, they don't just blow that. Like, it's not like a cartoon where everything blows straight up and the rock just goes up into the air and lands somewhere. What happens is the pressure builds up so much that the volcano fucking explodes. <laughs> yeah. Like an actual explosion of molten ash and sometimes lava. Yeah, it, it's stone and ash and glass and lava just detonate in every direction. 
And all of those things, minus lava, are already bad enough when they're not hot. But, you know, it's not just the lava that's hot. It's everything. And Yeah, and that, that is, that's basically what Ethan's doing, the emotional equivalent of. It's... He's plugging up a volcano. Yeah, you're sticking his finger in the dike. It's it's still gonna go eventually. <laughs> the structure, the integrity, the structural integrity is not there. It's gonna happen. It would be better if you could just let it out a little bit at a time. Yeah. Whereas, um, Ivy is erupting consistently in small geysers, which is like that one Hawaii not... volcano. <laughs> yeah, which is. Not harmless, but she can't have that kind of cataclysmic critical explosion we're talking about while she's doing that. Yeah, what's good? Like we said it earlier on in the episode, like what's going to happen to her is that eventually she's going to run out of steam. She'll just run out of fuel and she'll collapse in on herself and just be a husk until she finds something better to fill her up with. Ethan has to ex- has to explode cataclysmically. And then experience all the negativity and everything and build it. Like, he's going to go through more steps than she does. It's it's going to be rough one way or the other unless they find a compromise and start finding, figuring out that they are the solutions to their, to each other's problems and can reach a healthy equilibrium. And they need to because the world around them isn't going to get any better. They aren't in a position and they probably never will be where they can change that. It's only them can that can get better. And I think that's a good lesson for everybody, you know, uh, myself included, is that you, is learning to acknowledge that when even when your situation is bad, like if your situation is bad enough, the only the only thing you have room to really like affect change on is yourself and how you deal with that negativity. Yeah, and the happiest you can be is by being the best you can be, and really also ultimately allowing yourself to be because there's a lot of people who struggle to do both at once it's it's all too easy to think that part of being the best you can is not letting any of the negative show but that doesn't make it go away it just hides it so you can't you have to be you can't be the best version of yourself if you can't be every part of yourself. Well said. On that note, it's a little earlier than usual, but you know, you have uh, other engagements very soon, and I've got to deal with all my assorted ailments. <laughs> and I think we've mm. covered like a lot of good stuff anyway, despite that. So I think we'll probably finish up there. Yeah, you know, I mean, short description for a short story. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, we 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 were able to say a lot more than the amount of time it takes to read it. I would hope so. If I ever <laughs> write something that could be discussed in less time than it takes to actually read the story, I feel like I've fucked up. I don't know. Some people are pretty slow readers. You know, like especially as short stories go. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so uh, if you are listening to this on Spotify or Google Podcast, you can of course also find these episodes on my site, RadfordWrites.com, where I share the uh, written transcripts from stories like digging as well as other stuff. I also do like blog and article posts. Uh, you can of course also find me on Twitter at DanielWrites7, or if I'm still trying it and seeing how it works, at Blue Sky, which I'm just Radford Writes there. We'll see if I'm still doing that when this episode actually comes out. Uh, and you'll see plenty more of John in assorted projects, including more episodes of this podcast in the future. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, you're stuck with him. That's right. Deal with it. Positivity your way around that audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.